that they get their way. And they don't realize that our government and our freedoms are based on a two or three party. If we could ever get that legitimate third party, that would be helpful. <laughs> then we can keep everybody a little bit honest because with that third party, it throws things off balance a little bit and gets people out of other people's business. The two parties just end up working together. <laughs> That third party would keep thing, get the apple cart a little upset. But nonetheless, you have this particular situation, and all we can see is one party wants to try to destroy the other party and not realizing that the two-party system is what holds us together and that we need something called a fair election because as soon as people are, are disingenuous by, a, a, by an election, Boom, it's gone. You're down to one party, and that's called a dictatorship. I don't know about you, but I really do love freedom. And we have people who call themselves Christians that are going in and promoting that kind of thing, and here's what they don't get. If we ever fall into a socialistic country, there goes the church. Tell me what church is allowed to operate in a socialistic government. They're not. Government. Church. You They're can't. Not church. Socialistic church. governments church. bite the church and shut them down. Mm -hmm. yeah. Church is an enemy to a socialistic government. Mm -hmm. You know why? Because the corruption that's involved in a socialistic government and the church preaches supposed to against corruption. We become an enemy of the state. And they don't realize that. People think that the government will end up taking care of them if we move into a socialistic situation. It will not be anything further from the truth. For a socialistic government to work, all you can do is take away from the people. And you don't ever really ever get anything back. God help us to never go there. Yet there are people who feel that we should. I cannot understand that. Enough of that. That's a history lesson for today. But God is able to provide for us. But what he says is that, you know, it's not the physical things being provided for that really matter. What I want you to do is seek spiritual things first. Mm -hmm. Spiritual things first. Now, there's something here I'm about ready to share. And it, 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 I don't understand this. I would think that it would be the dominating theory, dominating message of the day. Let me see if I can explain this. For you see, if I was to take the sections of this book, and I were to show you the section that has the Gospels in it, it would be about this thick. That's the section of the book that talks about Jesus Christ and his life. And him laying down his life for us. But as soon as I put that section down and I raise up the other section of the New Testament, that section of the New Testament is about the Holy Spirit. How is it then that when the New Testament is divided up between the Son and the Holy Spirit, that nowadays you all you ever hear is people talking about the Son and Jesus Christ? And, and people are going to say, what? Jesus laid down his life? You're absolutely right. We would not have the power of forgiveness of sins if it were not for the blood of Jesus Christ. Yes. Not minimizing it whatsoever. But remember, God is God the Father. Say this with me. God the Son and God the Holy Spirit. Three in one. Yes. Why is it that we do not talk about the work of God the Holy Spirit when he is the whole thing after the Jesus Christ? In fact, Jesus himself said, I must go away, but I will send you the comforter. Why do we not preach about this? Why are we not teaching him and his work? I mean, the work of Jesus is done. He bled on the cross. We have forgiveness of sins. His blood paid the price. But it is the work of the Holy Spirit in our hearts today that is, makes us effective in this world. Why do not the evangelical churches preach about this? We preach Jesus, but we do not preach the Holy Spirit. And yet that's the whole second half of the New Testament. Amen. 
And Jesus even said, this is the one I want you to go to. I'm giving you him. Let's, yeah. let's, let's, let's satisfy him. Let's praise him. Let's acknowledge him. Let's worship him. By the way, it's still the Father and still the Son. Yes, it is. It doesn't separate any of them. You, you can't have one without the other. It just doesn't work. See if I can prove this. When Jesus said, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, all this will be added unto you. Turn with me over to Luke chapter 11. Okay. Luke chapter 11. We're going to be in, in verses um, 5 through 13 here. So right at the beginning of the chapter. Ready for this? I see. I love it when the Bible just comes together and stays consistent. So Jesus, in one part, he just got done teaching about seeking the kingdom of God and righteousness. So now he says this. Ready? Then he said to them, Suppose one of you has a friend, and he goes to him at midnight and says, Friend, lend me three loaves of bread, because a friend of mine on a journey has come to me and I have nothing to set before him. Then the one inside answers, Don't bother me! The door's already locked and my children are with me in bed. I can't get up and give you anything. I tell you, though he will not get up and give him the bread because he is his friend, yet because of the man's boldness, he will get up and give him as much as he needs. So I say to you, ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks, receives. He who seeks, finds. And to him who knocks, the door will be opened. Which of you fathers, if your son asks for a fish, will give him a snake instead? Or if he asks for an egg, we'll give him a scorpion. If you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? In another part, we have this nice little thing that says you have not because you ask not. Have you ever thought about this, this, this concept? How much of God can you get? The answer is, and a question, how much of God do you want? Yes. Do you think... If you're in love with your Heavenly Father, if you're in love with Jesus Christ the Son, if you're in love with God the Holy Spirit, and you're asking Him to be with you on a daily basis, and to walk with you on a daily basis, and to talk with you on a daily basis, I mean, let's get down to the hour basis. How about minute by minute? And you're asking Him and craving His presence and His Spirit. You think He's going to, not today, not going to be with you, I can't, I can't stand that. Does that even make sense to you? No. If you love being with somebody, yes, sir. Do you deny your time with them? No. I mean that that's that's just not the definition of love. Not even in a human. I tell you, I will prove to you who I love. Watch where I spend my time. I will prove to you what I love. Watch where I spend my money. It will tell you where my heart is. Didn't Jesus tell us that also? For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. You want to know why God provides for us? We are his treasure. He pours out his blessings on his children because he loves them. And all you have to do is say, hey, Dad, I want to spend some time with you. Boom! There he is. Why? 
because he's just waiting for you to invite him to spend time. I need more of your spirit. Well, I'll give you more of my spirit. Just ask. That's all you need to do is you crave me and I will give you all the time you could possibly handle. Think about that. And so when God provides, he provides salvation, he provides a spiritual walk, he provides his Holy Spirit. Let me see if I can illustrate this by a story out of the Old Testament. There was a guy that had a son. It was a miraculous son. It was his one and only son. God gave him that son. In fact, gave it to him in his old age. He shouldn't have been able to have a son. Definitely his wife should not have been able to have born a son. But she did. It was a miracle baby. And God gave them a son. In fact... God gave them their son at their old age to prove it was a miracle baby. She was beyond childbearing years. And she still got pregnant. How miraculous is that? <laughs> now, some of you ladies here this morning might go, oh, uh -uh, not me. <laughs> but she did. And she had the child. Now, when he was a little boy, this man felt that God spoke to him and said, I want you to take the child and I want you to offer him back to me as a sacrifice. Now, you do realize what that means. To offer a child up as a sacrifice means killing him. Kill him. Let his blood flow on an altar. Mm -hmm. Now, here's the amazing thing about the story. I've read that story and I've read that story and I've read that story. And I think if I put myself in the story... I would have been whining, moaning, and crying to God all the way. But as I read that story, you want to know one of the things that absolutely amazes me? Is that once God said it, he never opens his mouth. He just does it. Does it. Now let me ask you, isn't that amazing? If you put yourself in your shoes, how many times would you have questioned God about it? How many times would you have had, had maybe had to go run to somebody and talk to them about it and say, does this make sense? Maybe, maybe we might have opened up our mouths and other, no, no. Once it happened, boom. His mouth went shut. I can only imagine the mourning that was going on in his heart. But he gathered up everything that he needed, his servants, everything for the sacrifice, and he didn't fail to leave the child at home. He took his son with him. And he said, go to a place that I will show you. And God had a, had a very special place for him to go. And it says that when he got to the place, this is the name of it, by the way, Moriah, Mount Moriah. And when he got to that place, he said he lifted up his eyes and he knew. And God said, up there, that's where I want you to go. And so he left uh, his animals and everything else. And he grabbed everything for the sacrifice that he needed. And he ascended up on to the mount. Moriah. By the way, I have Zion right here. It's because Mount Moriah is on the north side of Mount Zion. There's a little song about that. Some of you may know it. It goes like this. Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised and sing with me. in the city of our God in the mountain of his holiness Beautiful for situation, the joy of the whole earth is Mount Zion on the sides of the north, the city of the great king. You see, David ended up, when David wrote that song, he ended up building Jerusalem, ended up surrounding both of those mountains. And his palace was on Mount Zion. Do you know what later was built on top of Mount Moriah? The temple. temple. But before the temple was built on Mount Moriah, God told Abraham to go offer his son as a sacrifice there. Yeah. You know why it's a beautiful place? Because I'll tell you something else that happened on Mount Moriah. 
Now, oh, well, let me finish the story in case I leave some of you hanging there just a little bit. He gets up to the top of the mountain, and his son asks him this question. This, this one would have been the one that would have tore my heart out as a parent. Father, we have the fire, and we have the wood. Where's the sacrifice? Boy, as a dad, I don't know. And Abraham said, God will provide himself a sacrifice. And then proceeded to bind the child and put him on an altar. It wasn't until the knife went up that God cried out through the voice of an Abraham, Abraham, stop. I see. I see your faith. I see what you would have done. But listen, did God still end up providing himself a sacrifice? Yes, because yes, over across the edge of the way was a ram that had been caught in the thicket by his horns. And God gave them a sacrifice. One of the other things that happened on Mount Moriah, the exact same place. God offered up his son. Instead of Isaac being offered up. You see, in the Old Testament, God gave us a picture of what it was going to look like to offer a son in a human. But the Heavenly Father ended up doing it instead. And He gave us Jesus. You see, when we think about all the things that God provides, the idea that he gave us his son and his Holy Spirit that we should be able to walk victoriously on this earth. What else do we need? Does food and clothes even matter when we have the spiritual goods to make heaven our eternal home? Come on, folks. Where's the intrinsic value on a spiritual life? We put too much value on having things here and now, and we have no clue, no eye, no vision, no value on the heavenly things that God wants us to have. That's great. Maybe I shouldn't say no, but let me tell you, say it this way. We don't give it the value it deserves. There, yeah. yeah. How do we place the value? Value is what we put on. How much value did Jesus put on it? How much value did the Father put on it? How much value does the Holy Spirit put on us being spiritual? Everything. That's what he gives value to. What's the physical life? Oh, you need, okay, I can do that. But what I really would like for you to do is seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. What I'd really like for you to do is to ask for the Holy Spirit and to be hungry to have all of me. Because listen, folks, all you have to do is ask. My name is Jehovah Jireh. I will provide. Yes. Let me prove it to you. You got Genesis 22? Yes, I do. 13 and 14? 13 and 14. Read it real loud for us. Abraham looked up, and there in a thicket he saw a ram caught by its horns. He went over and took the ram and sacrificed it as a burnt offering instead of his son. So Abraham called that place, the Lord will provide. And to this day it is said, on the mountain of the Lord it will be provided. On the mountain of the Lord, it will be provided. What will be provided on the mountain of the Lord? Everything that yes. you and I will ever need. That's the truth. Yeah. That Jesus Christ. The truth. Right. Yes. And the gift of the Holy Spirit. Because Jesus came and did his work, yes. we got the Holy Spirit. Yes. It's, it's an inclusive package. You can't have yeah. one without the other. Yep. Yeah. Ladies and gentlemen, take it all. God has kept his end of the bargain. How much of God do you want? You can have more than one. As, as much as you can stand, I guess. Yes. 
Help us, Lord. So God, help us to be hungry. Yes. But at this time of yeah. the year, what I'm asking us to do is to thank God for his provision. Next week, we're going to celebrate how God provides for us in the physical manner, the harvest. And you know, the uh, children of Israel, they have their Feast of Tabernacles. It's the same thing. God and his provision and what came of the fields. And we have our Thanksgiving, what has come in and how God has provided for us. And we're going to sit down and we're going to celebrate that. And it should be with a thankful heart. But listen, it's not just what God provided for us in this temporal world, but that God provided for us spiritually so that we can have our soul satisfied in his truth and ultimately being his children Father says, Dad says, all right, kids, come on home. Come on home. You know, and once you, once you get that grasp, let me tell you something. It's amazing how all of a sudden the fear about heaven, the fear about the unknown of what's on the other side, so it starts going away because we understand God's goodness and how he walks with us here. Can you imagine being ushered into his presence? Actually, there's a song that says, I can only imagine. I can only imagine. In other words, that's, I don't have what it takes to really understand to be what it is in heaven. I have not seen, nor ear has heard, what God has set up for his children. Awesome stuff. Let's take this season. And let's just thank the Lord and praise Him for His provisions for us. The name, it was put into tradition that the name of that place is It Will Be Provided. What is it? <laughs> it wasn't a hymn. It wasn't a thing. No, it was a thing. It's a it. Salvation be provided on that hill. Let's bow our heads in prayer. As we conclude our time of worship this morning, the question is, have you accepted God's provision for salvation? Have you hungered and thirst after his righteousness so that you could be filled with his spirit? Is that where your heart is? The only thing that we bring to this relationship is the ability to choose. That's all that we bring. God provides everything else. He provides the salvation. He provides the spirit. He provides the help. He provides the testimony. He does all the rest. There's only one thing, and, and it's very powerful, that one thing that we provide. That's the ability to choose. The control of our hearts to say, yes, Lord, I want you. So, have you asked the Lord Jesus Christ into your heart and life for the forgiveness of sins? Have you invited him in and asked God the Holy Spirit for his sanctifying power to fill you so that you will live life in the Spirit? As Jesus said, he would send the Comforter. Do we live there? Do you hunger and thirst after righteousness? <laughs> because the promise is that the people who do will be filled. Good. Heavenly Father, as we bow our heads before you, I ask and pray, you who searches the hearts, that you would that you would deal with hearts at home, where people may be watching and listening, and right here inside our little sanctuary. I ask and pray, Father, that if we don't know you as our personal Savior, if we have been laxed in our walk, if we have allowed the world to come in and just just take us over and our eyes have been taken off of you and and we haven't been hungering for God in our hearts and lives we we've just filled ourselves up with everything else father help us to get back to the basics get back to the thing that we need 
Oh, Father, help us with that hunger in our heart. And we bring to this the, the, the choice. God, we choose you. We choose to want the Holy Spirit in our life. And we choose to accept your forgiveness in our hearts. That's what we choose. But we need help in our hearts. Help us, Lord. Help us. God, we will give you the praise and thank you for your forgiveness and thank you for walking with us. God, we need you, Erebus. We need you desperately. We give you the praise, the honor, and the glory. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 If you have made some decision or done something of that in your heart today, would you just send me a short note and say, hey, pastor, I, 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 I'm choosing Jesus, or I've renewed my faith, or I, I've, I've, I had to ask God for forgiveness for something. If, if you've done that, then just, just send me a note and let me know, and I'll try to find a way to encourage you there at home. And, and uh, listen, it's all about the journey, and we're taking this journey together. We invite you to come along on the journey to be a part of it. Part of the journey is being faithful, being on the journey. You got to take it. You can't go over and sit alongside the road and thinking you're on the journey because you're not. Let's do this together, and you're invited to come along. Thanks for being with us this week. Join back with us next week, and if you're in the area, stop in and have dinner with us next week. Right? Yes. Amen. 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 All right. That concludes our our morning worship. Bye, everybody.